What's up guys, today I am sharing some benchmarks and a quick review of Intel's newest and fastest mainstream processor, the 8-core 16-thread Core i9-9900KS. The S stands for Special Edition, and while there aren't more cores and it's still based on Intel's existing 9th Gen 14 nanometer CPU architecture, it does run at 5 gigahertz on all cores right out of the box. Also, Intel sent an actual retail box along with it this time, so I now have my very own blue dodecahedron. Dodecahedron. Excellent! Deepcool knows that there's more than one way to cool a CPU, so for air cooling fans, they made the Assassin 3, a 280 watt TDP tower cooler that stays chilly and silent with seven heat pipes, dual 140 millimeter fans, and a polished nickel finish. Or if you prefer water cooling, the Castle 360EX is a 360 millimeter all-in-one with tasteful RGB lighting, exclusive anti-leak technology, and a copper base custom designed for maximum cooling performance. To find out more about Deepcool's Assassin 3 or the Castle 360EX, click the sponsor links in the description. Right, so no need to rehash any of the specific details because this is essentially a binned and juiced 9900K, which simply runs at a higher clock speed, albeit an impressive all-core 5 gigahertz clock speed. Yes, that means that for those of you with an existing 9900K that you have already overclocked successfully to 5 gigahertz or more on all cores, you don't need a 9900KS because basically you already have one. And let's see, is there anything else important that you guys need to know before benchmarks? Uh, it's available starting today, October 30th. Uh, they say that the quantity is limited for this special edition product, so kind of like the 8086 last year, I guess. This will probably only be available during the end part of 2019. Oh, and it does have a 127 watt TDP. That's up from 95 watt TDP on the regular 9900K, which makes sense. It's running at a higher frequency. And they're probably gonna try to charge like 600 bucks for it since the 9900K still goes for 490. Oh, actually over here it says the recommended customer price starts at $513. That's actually not bad when you compare it to the 9900K. Weird that it's 513 instead of 510 or 520 until you usually lists 1000 unit pricing for new CPUs for reviewers. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually gonna retail for 515 or 520 or 525, but I guess the last thing you should know is that it's still compatible with existing Z390 motherboards. You will just need a BIOS update to recognize the new CPU first. Anyway though, let's get into the benchmarks, starting with the setup. I have two test beds, one for Intel, one for AMD with minimal variance between the two setups. Both test beds are open and run the same memory, CPU cooler and graphics card. The memory is a 16 gig, two by eight gig kit of G-Skill Trident Z Royal RGB running at 3600 megahertz in Castle NC16. CPU cooler is the Noctua NH-U12A 120 millimeter tower cooler. And the graphics card is the Asus ROG Strix RTX 2080 Ti running with the out of the box manufacturer overclock. The Intel testbed is based on the ASRock Z390 Tai Chi Ultimate motherboard with a 500 gig Samsung 970 Evo M.2 NVMe SSD and an EVGA Supernova G3 750 watt power supply. The AMD testbed uses the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master motherboard, a 512 gig Samsung 970 Pro M.2 NVMe SSD and a Cooler Master MWE 1200 watt power supply. For comparison, I have five other CPUs, Intel's eight core 16 thread Core i9-9900K and the six core 12 thread Core i7-8700K, which cost $490 and $360 respectively as of the time of filming, and AMD's newest eight core 16 thread Ryzen 7 3700X and the $500 12 core 24 thread Ryzen 9 3900X. I am also including the Ryzen 2000 series flagship from last year, the eight core 16 thread Ryzen 7 2700X, which is based on the 12 nanometer Zen Plus architecture, whereas the 3000 series Ryzen CPUs are based on 7 nanometer Zen 2 architecture. And now the benchmarks. Let's start with frequencies, power draw, and temperatures. All the CPUs are running at stock speeds with XMP enabled, but no MCE or multi-core enhancement on the motherboard. All these CPUs can also adjust their frequency on the fly depending on load and temperature. So I wanted to show the peak frequency that a core or two might hit and the sustained frequency as well during a 10 to 15 minute IDA 64 stability test. Now this chart right here is pretty much the story of the 9900KS. It will turbo to five gigahertz on all cores while the 9900K only gets to 4.7 gigahertz across all cores out of the box. And the 8700K does just 4.3 gigahertz. Of course, both of these chips can be overclocked independently, but I guess the point is, why overclock your 9900K when you could just pay 24 more dollars for a 9900KS that is pre-overclocked? That 
makes perfect sense. I also measured temperatures during the IDA64 test, both average and max, as you can see here. The Noctua NHU12A is a great cooler, but the 9900KS does get hot, hitting a very toasty 107 degrees Celsius max temperature. But somehow I didn't see any frequency throttling, and the average was much more reasonable at 83.3 degrees Celsius, just about three degrees hotter than the 9900K. AMD's 7 nanometer 3000 series CPUs are still ahead in this category though, hitting only 79.5C on the 3900X and a practically frigid 71.2C on the 3700X. Power draw is also important for a CPU, of course, so here I measured full system power draw during a Blender CPU render test. The 9900KS only pulled about 10 more watts than the 9900K under load, 318 watts on average. But again, here the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs are showing off the efficiency gains from 7 nanometer, drawing just 161 watts on average for the 8 core 3700X and only 230 watts on average for the 12 core 3900X. Now let's move into the benchmarks proper, uh, starting off with some CPU performance benchmarks, and then we'll be moving into gaming benchmarks. Here is Cinebench R20, the new version of Cinebench. This is multi-threaded mode, so this is going to take advantage of all of the cores and threads in all of the CPUs. So 3900X has a big lead here with a score of 7047. That is about 27% faster than the 9900KS and a little over 30% faster than the 9900K. Although we can see that the 9900KS does get a nice boost from its five gigahertz clock speed and that gets its score up well over 5,000. Next up we have Cinebench in single threaded mode and here's where the Intel CPUs typically have a lead. Their single core performance has been better than the Ryzen CPUs and it still is better, but that gap has closed significantly. The 9900K here is actually still not outperforming the 3700X or the 3900X, which both scored over 500 points, but the 9900KS's five gigahertz clock Clock speed helped push it over the top with a total score of 515, regaining the lead in single threaded performance for St. Cinebench R20. Next up we have CPU Mark, which is the CPU focused part of the past Mark Performance Test 9 suite. The overall score is once again going to take advantage of all cores and threads, so the 3900X takes the lead once again. This is a good sort of reality check to compare to Cinebench scores. But we can see that the clock speed on the 9900KS has improved its score once again and gotten it up over 20,000 with a score of 20,458. That still wasn't enough to beat the 3700X, its eight core counterpart on the AMD side. The 3700X trails the 3900X by about 22 and a half percent, whereas the 9900KS is about 33% behind. Switching over to single threaded mode, we'll once again show the performance boost of the 9900KS with a score just shy of 3,000, 2,978 here. That was enough to beat the 3700X, 9900K, and 3900X, which are all around 2,900 when it comes to score. And in case you're wondering specifically, the 9900KS is about 3.15% faster than the 3900X in this test. And now we have Blender, an app that people actually use to do things. We're starting with the Splash Fishy Cat Render, which is a shorter one, typically lasts in the 20 to 30 second range. Remember, this is time listed, so lower is better. The 3900X is still winning with a time of 22.1 seconds, but the 9900KS shaves about a second and a half off of the 9900K score, 22.6 seconds and that is about 2.2% slower than the 3900X. Here's another Blender render test. This is the BMW 27 render, which takes a little bit longer than the Fishy Cat one. The 9900KS took 207 seconds to render this one out, which again is a pretty decent length behind the 3900X's time of 161 seconds, 22.2% slower to be precise. But here the 9900KS and 9900K outperform the eight core counterpart on the AMD side, the 3700X. Here are my results for the Adobe Premiere Media Encoder, and here again we're listing time, so lower is better. 9900KS actually wasn't even able to outperform the 3700X in this test. It took 291 seconds to do this 3 minute 4K H.264 render, and that put it about 7.2% slower than the 3900X, although still a, about a 5% improvement on the uh, 9900K score of 309 seconds. Next is Handbrake 1.2.2, doing more video work here, and here we take a 3 minute 4K video and transcode it to 1080 with the fast preset. 9900KS took 109.1 seconds in order to do this, rendering at a speed of 49.5 frames per second. And that was able to beat out all the other CPUs except of course the 3900X with its stellar score of 90 seconds and 60 frames per second. The 3900X really tears through handbrakes. So if you wanna do a lot of video transcoding, 
you're definitely gonna wanna go with something like the 3900X that has more cores and threads. Our next test is V-Ray, which is a computer-generated imagery rendering application developed by Chaos Group. Gives a score in K samples, so higher is better here. The 9900KS scored 14,643, and here in an anomaly that I couldn't explain but that was repeatable, the 9900K actually has a better score, 14,792. Retesting this led to the same results, and honestly, it's only about three quarters of a percent of a difference between the two. Regardless, the 3900X once again dominated in this test with a score of 19,727. And finally, we have Corona 1.3, our last CPU test, which does physically-based shading for production rendering. Here, the 9900KS took 92 seconds to run through its simulation demo, about a five-second improvement over the 9900K, and both CPUs are handily outperforming the 3700X, but the 3900X once again dominates with a score over 20% faster than the 9900KS, taking only 73 seconds. And now we're moving into some gaming benchmarks, starting off with the synthetic 3D Mark Fire Strike Ultra, which does run at 4K. If you want to look at the CPU performance, you want the physics score here, and the 9900KS has a pretty impressive score of 26,388. That's almost 3,000 points better than the original 9900K, so there's a nice result, although again, it lags behind the 3900X with its score of 28,337. That is about 7% slower if you want to be specific. And then if you look at the graphics scores here, they're all pretty similar to each other. So let's move on to 3D Mark Time Spy. Once again, you have a CPU, graphics, and overall score, and the CPU score is gonna show the most difference between these processors with the 3900X winning once again, but the 9900KS getting very close, only about 130 points off, that's about 1.1% slower. So this is probably the closest that came in a pure CPU test that does take advantage of all cores. And here, once again, we can compare the graphics scores. The 3900X and the 9900Ks are all pretty similar to each other. We only start to see some drop off once we move down to the 3700X and 2700X. Now I have a couple actual games that were run at 1920 by 1080. Here is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And here is where the 9900KS is supposed to shine. And, and it does. We can actually see a pretty significant improvement up to 154.4 average frames per second, which is an improvement over the 9900K's already dominant score of 149.7 average frames per second. 8700K also doing really well here. And this is why Intel CPUs are still very frequently recommended for gaming. They tend to get a little bit more out of a graphics card in a CPU limited situation. That said, you have to kind of put it in a CPU limited situation, which this definitely is. But given that we're looking at an over 21% improvement with the 9900KS compared to the 3900X, in situations like high refresh rate 1080p gaming, this really is probably the CPU you'd want to go with over AMD. And my last gaming test is Grand Theft Auto V, also running at 1920 by 1080. And here the 9900KS has my best score ever, 176 average frames per second, over 10 FPS faster than the 9900K, and nearly 20 FPS faster than the 3900X. All that said, of course, if you were to play these games at higher resolutions, you would see these variances between the different CPUs flatten out as the test became more GPU dependent. That said, let's take a look at some cumulative performance, starting off with overall compute performance. I took the compute tests that I ran, I established the 3900X as a 100% baseline, and here I'm showing relative cumulative performance of the 9900KS and down the line. 86.8% is the relative performance there, so you're looking at about 13% less performance if you're looking strictly at the CPU tests. And I think here it is worth pointing out that the 9900K with its old clock speeds was not able to beat the 3700X in the core for core matchup since those are both the eight core 16 thread parts. So if the 9900KS does have a win here, it's that it is now once again, the faster of the two eight core parts and it has beaten the 3700X in CPU performance. Switching to game performance, and again with the 3900X as the 100% baseline, the 8700K, 9900K, and 9900KS all outperform it when it comes strictly to the gaming performance. And that's just barely with the 8700K, it only has a 0.4% performance improvement, but the 9900K is 5.8% faster, and the KS is 9.1% faster. So that clock speed really is important here, and I think another reason why Intel has done what they've done with the 9900KS and shipped a part that just has higher clock speeds overall. Compare this to the price though, and it might give you a better idea of what you should go for. Are you going for a gaming system? Are you going for a compute system? Are you going for a balance between them? How much money do you have to spend? 
Hopefully that's all accumulated on this chart right here. Although I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just giving you the results so you can make the decision yourself. If you're not willing to overclock a 9900K, then I would definitely say it's worth the extra $25 or so for the 9900KS. But I think you should also consider that the 3900X is right about the same price at $500. You will only get about five to 10% less performance with the 3900X. And again, that is only in CPU limited situations where you're playing at lower resolutions. And if you look at the drop off in CPU compute performance, it seems to me that if you want a more balanced system, the 3900X is still definitely the way to go. Although if you are looking strictly at the gaming performance, the 9900K and 9900KS both still are viable. Okay, so once again, my cynical side is urging me to point out some things about this product. Like maybe the 9900KS is just an Intel planted hype bomb meant to distract your attention from AMD and get a few more people talking about a platform that hasn't really received any meaningful upgrades or improvements this year. And that's probably true. I mean, they did send out these review kits to a much wider sampling of people, people like me, YouTubers and otherwise, this time around, more than I've seen them do before. And they also had an unboxing embargo for it just a couple days ago, which is a great way for a manufacturer like Intel to get reviewers to make two videos on their product instead of just one. That said, Intel is changing, albeit slowly, and I think the price of the 9900KS is the biggest indicator of that. Intel isn't milking it by selling it for 100 bucks more than the 9900K and being like, oh, it's a special edition, people should just pay for it. It's only a modest 20 or $30 more expensive. That means that I might even recommend it to someone who was already looking at a 9900K, presuming that they've already looked at the seven nanometer Ryzen stuff too and decided that they just don't need a bunch more compute performance or PCI Express Gen 4. So good job there, Intel, and I hope you continue to price CPUs in a way that makes them more viable for consumers. And just FYI, this is still on the more expensive side, given that it's an eight core, and right now we're dealing with 12 cores and up at the $500 price point. For my money, I think I'd still go with a 3900X right now, but if you're purely interested in gaming performance, there is still a case to be made for Intel's 9000 series CPUs. That's all I've got for today though. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I will put links in the description for as much of this parts and hardware that I can. And yeah, if you're not subscribed to my channel, I encourage you to do that. Maybe hit the little bell icon. I've heard that is also very helpful. And if you're feeling kind, you could also click the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this video. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you in the next one.